In this video, I'm going to show you the results of deep sky imaging with a long focus classic refractor, a telescope that you probably wouldn't normally use for deep sky imaging. A classic refractor has got two glass elements at the front, a long tube and a focuser at the back, and you often use it to look at things with an eyepiece. The reason you wouldn't use it for deep sky imaging is because the glass type isn't really well suited to correcting all the primary wavelengths of light. Visually, you can see some blue haloing around bright stars, but if you are to take a long exposure, that blue haloing would be amplified. And that's why people tend to use special glass for deep sky imaging if they're using a refractor. They use a refractor with ED glass, extra low dispersion glass, which doesn't disperse the wavelengths of light as much. Or they'd use a refractor with a triplet lens, where each of those lenses uh, compensates for one of the primary wavelengths of light and more recently people are using flat field refractors where you've got that correction at the front and then a couple of lenses or one lens at the back to help flatten out the image as well as correct for the primary wavelengths of light so those are becoming more common now you don't see many people imaging with long classic refractors and that's what we're doing here tonight I've got the refractor sitting on a Warpastron 17 mount. It's a harmonic drive mount. I'm using my latest camera that I purchased a few months ago, which is the ZWO ASI 533 MC Pro. This is a cooled camera, so I've got the camera cooled to minus 10. I'm only taking light frames. I'm not bothering with flats or darks or anything like that. On the first night, I set about imaging the uh, fish head nebula. It's nicely framed by the uh, combination of my telescope's focal length and the sensor size and it's a fairly bright nebulae. I took an hour's worth of three minute exposures and then my guiding went quite badly uh, I noticed on the graph and that was because my lens on my guide scope had fogged up because I didn't have any due control in place. Also when I went inside after that session I noticed that I'd left an aperture mask in front of my uh, telescope lens which actually brought the aperture down to 90 millimeters which made the focal ratio f11 which is an even dimmer image so I'd further handicap myself without realizing just by not checking not checking the telescope properly beforehand so on this on my second night out I corrected both of these things I I removed the aperture mask so we're using the full 120 mil aperture lens and I made a makeshift uh, dew shield for my guide scope. Now I set about, I thought I'd go for a galaxy. Uh, Andromeda's too big really to frame. So I looked at the second biggest galaxy, which is the Triangulum M33, and it just about fit the sensor. So I thought, perfect, it's quite a bright galaxy as well. So I set about taking two minute exposures of that object, but Within about 20 minutes, the camera, because of the length of the telescope, uh, it was getting too close to the tripod leg. So I aborted capturing that object when I couldn't really get my finger in between the camera and the tripod leg. Things were getting too close for comfort there. Didn't want to have a collision. So I went over to the Bubble Nebula, and um, which is a smaller, dimmer neb object. So I because it's a bit of a dimmer object, I set about taking four minute exposures of that. My guiding was going okay-ish at the time. Now this big long telescope is a bit of a wind sail. So when I say my guiding was good-ish, it was like two arc seconds. Uh, so usually you'd probably want below one, but it's fine. I still had round stars as a result of it, so it was fine. Um, I managed to capture an hour on that object before the clouds rolled in. All in all, I've got a nebula with um, one hour, a galaxy with 20 minutes, and another nebula with one hour. So these aren't huge amounts of integration time that we've captured here. So that needs to be taken into consideration. When we look at the results, if you look at the fish head nebulae, you can see even though we're stopped down to 90 mils f11, there's still quite a bit of haloing, colour haloing around the brightest of stars. Um, and that's the chromatic aberration. And, but the, the image is quite flat. I mean, I'm using a small sensor camera, which helps definitely, but there's no need for a flattener, I didn't, I didn't think, and no vignetting or anything like that. So it's quite easy from that perspective. Also, 
With a long focus refractor, the focus is long, which means it stays in focus within quite a long range of turning the focuser knob. So I didn't have to adjust focus throughout the night. With some faster imaging telescopes, it tends to have like a, a faster f4, f5, even in some cases f2 focal ratio. That, that focal plane is razor sharp and even a millimetre either side of it will mean that you're out of focus. None of that worry here whatsoever. If we look at the Triangulum Galaxy, bearing in mind it's only 20 seconds worth of exposure. Again, we've got the chromatic aberration, but I think it's shown some lovely detail, close-up detail, knots and stuff in the spiral arms. And uh, I was quite pleased with this one considering it's only 20 minutes data. Also, again, it's a very flat image. I was quite pleased with that one considering the integration time and the fact that I've only took light frames. Now, when I went over to the bubble, that was near a very bright star and I feel that the chromatic aberration around that very bright star is sort of interfering with your eye when you're focusing on the, the bubble nebula. It certainly does with me. And that's just a bit of an unfortunate placement of a bright star, I feel. I feel like if you're going to image with an acromat, it's good to be mindful about bright stars in the area because they will show that big violet halo around them and maybe a distraction from the object you're trying to image and the stars just tend to sort of like leap out at you more because they're a bit bigger and take your eye away from the object now i know you can do things in post-processing to deal with this so it may not be a problem for some people but again flat field and i was really happy that i didn't have to mess about with focus during the whole thing it just keeps nicely focused but the main the main thing i found difficult was just the sheer length of the telescope because not only have you got the meter long 100 centimeter long tube of the telescope you've got the focuser having to be racked out quite a long way thankfully it's got a lot of focus travel and then the, the camera pulled out a slight bit as well to reach focus I, could, I mean I could have used an extension tube but it does reach focus with the focuser it's got so that's fine but it does add quite a bit of length and as mentioned earlier it did mean that I was having trouble with the camera getting quite close to the tripod legs there we have it I mean you could achieve more with longer integration times and a bit of post-processing to clean up the stars. I think most people would like to have better colour corrected stars. So yeah, it was an interesting experiment really. A bit unwieldy getting it through doorways. So next I'll be looking at the Richie Cretchen that I've just purchased from Flow off the clearance section, which is a carbon fibre six inch model F9. So again, it's slow, but it's got very nicely corrected optics, very flat, no chromatic aberration, anything like that. And it's a bit more compact, even though you have to add a bit of extension rings at the back and a dew shield at the front, still more compact. So anyway, it'll be an adventure to see how we tame that uh, beast because they can be um, take a bit of work to get up and running, but we'll see how that goes on the next video. Cool. Okay. I just want to thank my channel members and Patreons for all the support you give the channel. I'll put links down in the, in the description and take care everyone and see you on the next video.